Hello and welcome again. In today's programme we're going to be making pancakes and marmalade. And we're going to start off with pancakes and that means making a proper pancake batter. And to do this you start off with a nice big bowl, steadied on a tea towel here to keep it steady, and four ounces of plain flour which has been sifted into the bowl. And then what I'm going to do is just make a well in the centre of the flour and drop two large size one eggs into the centre. So four ounces of plain flour, two eggs, then we're just going to have a pinch of salt. And then the liquid I'm using is going to be seven fluid ounces of milk, which is already measured here, and to join that, three fluid ounces of water. So that's the liquid. Now I believe the best way to make a pancake batter if possible, is to use one of these, which is an electric hand whisk. And what you do is switch on and start combining the eggs into the flour. So as you whip the eggs in the centre there, they begin, the liquid begins to incorporate the flour all round the edges. Now you can make this batter, if you like, with a fork, a lot of hard work, or a balloon whisk, or you can actually use a food processor, but sometimes a food processor, you can get a little clog of flour on the blade, and that's not very satisfactory. So I think overall, an electric hand whisk is best. Now when it begins to look stiff, then you can start to add your liquid bit by bit with the beaters still running. We can increase the speed a bit now too. What you need to end up with is a nice, smooth, lump-free batter. And what happens as you begin to incorporate all the liquid, you find that some of the flour stubbornly sticks to the edge of the bowl. So stop halfway through. Take um, a rubber spatula like this and just get all that flour into the center so that all the lumps can be whisked in. As soon as the batter is completely smooth and lump free um, it's going to need one more ingredient and then we can make the pancakes. And the other ingredient is this here. Now in a saucepan I've got two ounces of melted butter. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add two tablespoons of that to the batter, which will give it a nice bit of moistness, and just stir it in. And then, next to me here, on the hob, I've got, over a gentle heat, a pancake pan. And this is seven inches in diameter. I'm going to turn the heat right up now. Um, this is a traditional pancake pan that people buy one of these, it lasts a lifetime and you always make your pancakes in this. But you don't have to have this, any good solid uh, frying pan 7 inches in diameter will be alright. But this is what this looks like and in good kitchen shops you can buy little sort of handle cosies which make it easier to handle. Now what you want is to have the pan looking very very hot as it is now and then you need to lubricate it. So what I do is I roll up some kitchen paper like this into a little wadge and then dip it in the rest of the melted butter and then just lubricate the pan. And now you can see how hot it is. Next thing you do is turn it down to medium. It needs to be hot to begin with, then down to medium. And to make our first pancake, we're going to use two tablespoons of batter. Immediately the batter's in, just eke it round the pan like that. You usually find that when you make your first pancake, you need a sort of practice one. It doesn't quite, as you can see there, I haven't quite got enough batter there to cover the base of the pan. But you just need to get the feel of the amount of butter. But Batter, sorry, not butter. But what you need to be remember is two tablespoons is about right for seven inches in diameter. Then you count up to 30 seconds and have a little peep, have a palette knife ready. And when it looks brown, just take the palette knife and flip it onto the other side. And then give it another 30 seconds. 
And then when that's done, you just carry on making pancakes. And the good news is that pancakes freeze divinely. So if you're in the mood, you can switch the radio on, make several lots of batter, and just make a whole stash of pancakes for the freezer and just bring them out as and when you need them. In a moment, I'm going to show you some nice pancake recipes. But this is a traditional pancake. So we'll just turn it onto the plate like that. And then the next thing it needs is lemon and sugar. But if you're going to serve them all straight away, if you're not freezing them, then you need to put the plate over a pan of simmering water. And then as you make each pancake, you put a sheet of paper to stop them sticking together, greaseproof paper or silicone paper. Or you can have everybody sitting at the table and just waiting, and you can just make the pancakes and serve them. They can eat one, and then they can eat another one. Either way, the way to eat them traditionally is to give a generous sprinkling of caster sugar first, and then a good squeeze of lemon juice all the way over the surface of the pancake, and be really, really generous with the lemon juice. Then just roll it up like that, a little bit more sugar, a little bit more lemon juice over the top, and garnish with another piece for people to squeeze over if they want even more lemon juice. Now I'm going to show you another pancake recipe. These are apple crepes with Calvados, and you begin by coarsely grating a large Granny Smith apple. Then you toss the grated apple in two tablespoons of Calvados and leave it aside to soak for 10 minutes. The pancake batter is plain flour, buckwheat flour, flavoured with cinnamon, and it's beaten up with eggs and creme fraiche. Then to the batter, you add the soaked apples and calvados. These crepes are quite small, so just use one tablespoon of batter. Then once it's crisp at the edges, turn it over and cook the other side until golden brown. To serve the crepe, set light to three tablespoons of Calvados warmed through in a small saucepan. Pour it all over the crepes, then add just a sprinkling of caster sugar. And as they go to the table, add some well-chilled pouring cream. Well, earlier in the programme I told you how divinely basic pancakes freeze, so now I'd like to show you some recipes. If you've got a stack in the freezer, it's nice to pull them out and make some really nice recipes. And the first one I want to show you is an Italian recipe, and this is called pancake cannelloni. And I have a friend who lives in Umbria, and she's told me that in that part of Italy, they sometimes make their cannelloni with pancakes instead of pasta, and now I've made it like that, I think it's actually much better. Now, you start off with 12 pancakes, and then you need a quantity of this, which is ragu bolognese. Now, to make a really authentic, classic ragu bolognese, you need to start with two medium onions chopped, four cloves of garlic, and five ounces of chopped pancetta. These should be browned in three tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil. And then the meat I'm using is one pound of minced pork, one pound of minced beef, and half a pound of finely chopped chicken livers. These have all been browned in olive oil first. Now you add the contents of two tins of Italian chopped tomatoes, and then two tubes of concentrated tomato puree. Half an ounce of basil leaves go in next, torn before they're added, then half a bottle of red wine, then three quarters of a whole nutmeg freshly grated. A seasoning of salt and freshly milled black pepper, then transfer it to a low oven gas mark one without a lid and give it four hours long, slow simmering. By this time, the sauce will have reduced down and really concentrated in texture and flavor. Now you can put it into polythene bags and freeze it for later, or you can make pancake cannelloni. And what you do is you just put a tablespoonful, like I've done there, onto a pancake and just simply roll it up. And then just tuck the ends over like that and place it in a gratin dish, an oven-proof gratin dish. And I said before, this makes 12. 
all together and that will feed four to six people. Some people can eat two, some people can eat three, depends on the appetites. Tuck the edges over like that and fit them all neatly into the dish. Now the next ingredient is this one here. This is grated mozzarella cheese, three ounces, and I'm just going to sprinkle the mozzarella cheese around the pancakes. And while they cook, this sort of melts down to a lovely divine creaminess that goes very well. And then after that, we need some bechamel sauce. And I've got here three quarters of a pint of bechamel sauce, or white sauce. And this has been made um, by the all-in-one method, where you put everything in the saucepan, butter, flour, milk, and then you just whisk it all together. It's flavoured with bay leaves and nutmeg, which is the Italian way of making it. And that goes over the pancakes and spread it over a little bit and give the dish just a little shake like that to get a good coating. And then finally, the other ingredient is this, and this is one and a half ounces of grated Parmesan cheese. And that goes over the top, and this will go into a hot oven, gas mark six, and it'll take about half an hour to get really nice and brown and crusty on the top and bubbling around the edges. There's a little bit there that hasn't quite gone over the pancake, so I'll just sort that out. And now I'd like to show you another recipe for pancake cannelloni. This one is without meat, and this one is called pancake cannelloni with spinach and four cheeses. And we've got four beautiful star Italian cheeses that we're going to use. The first one is a ricotta. That's a whey cheese, and that is very light, and it's got a lovely sort of lactic flavour. Next door, its stronger cousin is gorgonzola. Very creamy, but nice and salty and lots of gutsy flavour. This one is mozzarella, which will give a lovely creamy texture to the finished pancakes. And then this one, the great Italian star of all time, which is parmesan. And make sure that you get always parmigiano reggiano. This is the stamp, because that's the real parmesan cheese, and it does have a much superior flavour to the other kind. So, to make our pancakes, once again, you start off with a bechamel sauce. This time, it's a pint of bechamel sauce. I just wanted to show you this, because if you make it in advance and you don't want to get a skin on it, what you do is just cover it like that with cling film, and then you'll find you won't get a skin on it. And this bechamel is made exactly the same way as the other one. But what we're going to do now, if you don't have any meat, you have something else special, and that is this. And this is two and a half fluid ounces of double cream. So this is going to be a really creamy bechamel sauce. So that'll just be worked into the rest of the sauce. Right, that's the sauce. Now we're going to move on to the spinach. And what I've got here is one pound of spinach. And that's been cooked in a saucepan with just a knob of butter and then drained and chopped. And I'm going to add now to it First of all, the ricotta cheese, five ounces of ricotta. And then I've got five ounces of gorgonzola. And when you cook the spinach, don't forget to give it a good squeeze to get all the liquid out of it before you put it into the bowl. And here I've got Parmesan cheese, two and a half ounces of Parmesan. And then I've got a bunch or a packet of finely chopped spring onions. And all I'm going to do now is just mash that all together with a fork to get it all thoroughly combined and evenly mixed. And then this will be the filling for the pancakes. What happens is it just gets a little bit sort of stiff and claggy, as you can see. So what you do is, before you actually stuff the pancakes, you add some of that lovely bechamel sauce, about a quarter of it all together. Give that a final mix. And that's the filling now, ready for exactly the same amount of pancakes as before. 12 pancakes. Lovely thin pancakes, the way I showed them. Just two tablespoons in a seven-inch pan gives you the right kind of pancake. 
And now what we'll do is rescue the spoon from the sauce over here and put, again, the same, roughly the same amount as we did with the bolognese, about a tablespoonful. And then roll in the same way as we did before. Over, tuck the edges under like that and place it into the baking dish. We'll just do one more. Now, the cooking times for both are exactly the same. Is you preheat the oven, gas mark six, and you cook them for about half an hour. And now, again, I'm going to sprinkle on some mozzarella. And I've got four ounces of mozzarella here. And that's just going to be tucked in, on, and around the pancakes, which gives that lovely, when you serve it, that lovely sort of stretchy cheese. Finally, that lovely creamy sauce is going to go on, exactly the same way as it did before. And I've just remembered something that I should have told you but never mind, it's not too late. And that is, when you make cannelloni and you're using a dish like this, make sure it's very, very well buttered. Now, just spread that over a little bit to make sure it covers the pancakes. And then finally, some more Parmesan cheese because... That's one of the four cheeses, and that's going to give it a lovely crusty top. And this time we've got one and a half ounces. There we are. Next thing we're going to see is the cooked cannelloni. What I didn't tell you before is if you've got little individual heat-proof bowls like this, you can actually cook two pancakes at a time. They'll fit in nicely, in which case they'll take 20 minutes to cook, and that will be one very nice portion. But now we'll have a look at the larger one, which has had its full cooking time. There we go, nice and brown and crusty on the top and bubbling all around the edges. And um, I think really two pancakes is about right for one person. So we'll find two pancakes now and just serve them out. And you'll see the mozzarella that's melted becomes all lovely and creamy and stretchy. So that's pancake cannelloni with four cheeses. Right, well now we're going to move on from pancakes to making homemade marmalade. And it's about this time of the year, in the depths of winter when everything else is a bit dull and dreary, that we see the arrival of these lovely fruits. These are several oranges from Seville in Spain, and they're the only oranges that you can make real proper marmalade from. And the reason you can make marmalade from several oranges so successfully is because the fruit of the oranges and the skin is very, very bitter. It, they don't look very attractive. They've got sort of very knobbly, rough skins, and you wouldn't want to buy those to eat, and you wouldn't want to eat them either. But because um, making a preserve requires a large amount of sugar, if you've got bitter fruits like these and you put all the sugar in, you've still got something at the end of the day that has that sharp, tangy flavour that can't be matched by any other conserve in the world. Well, homemade marmalade always tastes a lot better than any shop-bought marmalade. So now, I want to show you how to do it. Begin by simmering three pounds of washed several oranges, two lemons in five pints of water for about three hours. Then using a slotted spoon, remove the fruit to a bowl. Take the oranges, which are now very soft, and cut them into quarters. Scrape off all the flesh and pips and put these into a saucepan. Then add two ladles of the poaching liquid to the pulp and boil for 10 minutes. While that's happening, cut the orange skins into strips. The size is up to you, but don't use the lemons. Return this chopped peel to the poaching liquid in the preserving pan. Now line a sieve with some muslin. Take the pulp mixture which has been allowed to cool and strain it. Firstly, using a wooden spoon, but then gathering up the muslin and squeezing the liquid out. This provides the pectin that's going to set the marmalade, so you need to squeeze every last drop to set it properly. Now stir the liquid, orange peel and pectin, 
cover with a cloth and leave overnight. Next day, reheat the mixture. Then add six pounds of sugar that has been warmed in a low oven for 10 minutes and stir it in very thoroughly. Don't let it boil until the sugar is completely dissolved. You can check this by looking for sugar crystals on the back of the spoon. Now you can bring it up to simmering point and leave it to simmer and bubble away until it goes really dark. This will take about three to four hours. To test for a set, place a spoonful on a very cold plate, then give it a push with your finger. If you get a crinkly skin like this, then the marmalade is ready. Ladle into some warm jars and label the next day when it's completely cold. So here it is, dark, chunky marmalade. No other country in the world can make marmalade like we can. And for a change, here's another marmalade recipe. This one's made with some tinas, or you can make it with any of the tangerine family, and it just gives something slightly different, a variation. If you want a real wake-me-up marmalade, this is the one for you. This is lemon and lime and has a lovely, sharp, tangy flavour. Once you've made some marmalade, how about a marmalade recipe? This is marmalade bread and butter pudding. And you start off with day-old slices of bread, spread them thickly with butter and then spread them even more thickly with marmalade. Now place another slice on top, spread some more butter on top of that and cut the sandwiches into quarters and arrange in a baking dish. The mixture I'm pouring over here is 10 fluid ounces of milk, 2.5 fluid ounces of double cream, 3 ounces of sugar and 3 eggs. Scatter the surface with grated orange zest, demerara sugar and chopped candied peel. Then bake in the oven at gas mark 4 for 30 to 40 minutes until it's puffy and golden and the top is crunchy. Then serve the pudding straight from the oven with chilled pouring cream. Now we're going to make a recipe from the past, something that will give us a little bit of sparkle on a cold, frosty, wintry night. Because this is called crepe Suzette, and crepe Suzette were very popular in the 60s. And too popular, in fact, and everybody sort of got a bit bored with them. But I think it's nice to have a revival because, in fact, I remember how lovely they were and I'd like you to know how lovely they were. Now, this time, we've got the same pancake batter that we made before, but this time, it's a sweet batter, so it's going to have in it um, the grated zest of an orange and also um, a tablespoon of caster sugar to make the sweet batter. Otherwise, the ingredients are the same as before. I'm just going to give that a little mix. And crepe Suzettes are very thin pancakes, if possible. So what I want to do is make a pancake now. We're just going to lubricate the pan and then try and use fractionally less batter this time to make the pancakes as thin as possible. About one and three quarter tablespoons instead of two tablespoons. Now, you don't have to worry if it doesn't quite fill the pan. They don't have to be perfect round um, pancakes because what we're going to actually do in a second is fold them up. So don't worry if you've got, as I've got there, a few gaps. Same 30 second wait, then just see how the pancakes are doing. That's not quite ready yet, so what I'm going to do is just get rid of my bowl here and bring in the rest of the pancakes. And you should get 16 if you make thinner ones like this. Now we're just going to turn that over onto its other side for a few seconds. It's very, very thin and very, very lacy. But that's how it's supposed to be. Then, as soon as that's ready, it's going to join the rest of the pancakes over here. And now we're going to switch frying pans because this time you need to have a large frying pan. This one's about 10 inches in diameter. And have the heat turned up to high and we're going to make a sauce. And the sauce is an orange sauce, a sweet orange sauce. First of all, 
five fluid ounces of freshly squeezed orange juice. That's about three large oranges. Also the juice of a large juicy lemon. And then here I've got the zest of the lemon and the grated zest of the orange. And the next ingredient is two ounces of butter. And that's going to go in to join the citrus juices and melt into them. And then we've got caster sugar again, another tablespoon into the sauce. And because you're going to spoil your friends on a cold, dark evening, we're going to use three tablespoons of Grand Marnier liqueur, which is a lovely sort of caramel orange flavour. Now just get the butter melted into the sauce. And as soon as it's melted, we're going to add the pancakes. Now the butter's melted, we can turn the heat down and begin to add the pancakes. And what happens is you put the first pancake in and really all you're doing now is reheating the pancakes gently in all those lovely citrus juices. Just sort of baste it a little bit so that you get, get it completely submerged. Then what you do is you turn the pancake over and make a half and then you turn it over again and make it into a sort of triangle shape like that. Then move it over to the side and put your next pancake in and do exactly the same thing. And as they begin to be folded and soaked in the sauce, the sauce will begin to disappear because it will all be soaked into the pancakes, giving them the most wonderful citrus flavour. Well, now you can see the pancakes have soaked up all that lovely juice which is impregnated in them, giving wonderful flavour. So we're going to have a bit of fun here, or we're going to try to. What we're going to try and do is flame the pancakes as they go to the table. Now, how you do this is, you, first of all, you warm a ladle, get it really warm. It needs to sort of look as if it's almost up to simmering point and feel quite hot when you touch it with the finger. Then you need to grab your pan firmly in one hand, set light to the brandy and carry it to the table and it'll just carry on flaming in the, label, in the ladle like that. And then when you arrive at the dining room table, make sure you've got the lights out and you just pour it over the pancakes while everybody goes, wow. So there we are. That's Memories of Pancakes Past. But I hope you'll come back and join me next time. We're doing a programme called Stars from the East and the stars are Oriental dishes. So I'll see you then.